we got a great panel to uh, to follow here and to kick off uh, the real the real the day here of experts. One of the things that we do at the New Politics Institute and at NDN, but we uh, we essentially draw off of people in the community, uh, out in the private sector or in the politics themselves, who really get these changes, whether it's in tools or technology, whether it's in demographic groups, whatever. And we leverage their insights and bring them into the political process as best we can. And what we've got here on the, this group is a terrific group of folks who can give us various insights into this evolving political model and what they're seeing and how, that, how technology and the new tools are actually really um, affecting that. And so I'm going to introduce, uh, I'll just give a quick introduction to that, but, and, and then we're going to basically jump in here. But uh, Mika Sifri, who's going to kick off on the far side there, Mika is terrific. He's one of the founders of uh, the Personal Democracy Forum, which if you don't know about it, you should tune into it. It's, it's a little more oriented towards people really into the tech a little bit more, but how technology is changing politics. They've got a great conference in June coming up in, um, in New York, which is terrific. They also have run Tech President, which is a fantastic blog that's following essentially uh, how the different presidential candidates are using this. Mika's going to kick off. We've got Tracy Russo here, who is going to give us some insight from the really in the trenches there. She came off the the, uh, the Edwards campaign was the chief blogger, was also the deputy director of the online communications, and so she was involved with fundraising, uh, mobile media, and various other things, as well as engaging uh, the whole blogosphere and the whole Netroots community, and, and can give us insight there, as well as she's got her own strategy and communications company that she uh, can talk about into groups in general. And uh, we've got Jerry Mikowski here, who is a longtime technology, I always call him, put him in the guru kind of space. Uh, he used to run a very famous newsletter uh, called Release uh, 1.0, which is Esther Dyson's uh, insiders kind of look at technology through the 90s there, which was just a, just a must read for many people in technology to what's the next big thing coming. And since then, he spent a lot of time basically um, watching a lot of the emergent trends, sees how it's happening in business around the world, different how this is applying. And although he's not, he's not particularly geared to politics, he's going to do some reflections on how basically a lot of things that are happening in other sectors and other uh, industries might actually be able to be brought in. So anyhow, it's a great panel. We're really happy to have him here. We're going to basically have short presentations, and then we're going to have basically half this session will be for interaction with you. So think about questions, and for that matter, questions for, that you got for the day, it'd be great to see it. So Mika? Thanks, Pete. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Micha Sifri. I work with the Personal Democracy Forum and Tech President. Um, it's a lot of fun to be here. I've been to some of uh, Simon and Pete's talks up in New York, so it's fun to come and, and make the trip down and, and join the conversation with you. Um, I have to say I, I'm suffering at the moment from a little bit of PowerPoint envy because Pete's presentation was um, really fantastic and, and uh, uh, virtuoso in, in his use of the tools and I'm, uh, I've, I've tried for a long time not to actually uh, learn how to use this because I think if power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely and um, <laughs> so we're not going to, uh, I'm, I'm, and, and frankly uh, uh, Pete touched on really a lot of the same themes that I wanted to emphasize uh, so I'm going to try and, and just sort of amplify and clarify a few things and, and uh, Hopefully, it'll begin to sink in for you. Uh, the, the topic I want to address is, what is network politics, and how is it changing the system? And to start out, this is kind of the old model in, in pure, uh, purified form. The P is the politician or the leader. The Cs at the bottom are the citizens. And it, what we all grew up in is a system that was uh, top down. The kind of communication that happened was one way from the top to the mass. It was expensive to participate in, in terms of actually uh, having voice in the process. It was driven by elites. The only day when masses of people actually got to participate was election day. And it was very cold. Uh, there were all kinds of gatekeepers for entry into this, whether it was the actual campaign organization or the media gatekeepers. Uh, you know, uh, William Sapphire actually referred to uh, the great mentioner uh, in terms of how conventional wisdom was formed. There were just a fairly small group of people who controlled all the choke points. Um, now, this is, I think, radically changing. And what we are seeing is the emergence of networked politics. And again, this is just building on points that Pete made earlier. It isn't just that 
you still have that communication coming from the top down to the mass of, of individual citizens. And you have citizens able to talk back. And most importantly, you have citizens able to talk sideways. They can network with each other. And the effect is that the bottom and the conversation and the activity that happens among people in the bottom becomes much more important. Instead of one speaking to many, you have many speaking to many. The cost of entry is much lower. And as a result, we are seeing mass participation by citizens every day in the process, not just on election day. And here's the fundamental change from the point of view of campaigns, advocacy organizations, institutions. It's out of your control, OK? And I, I want to emphasize three particular ways. It's in terms of creation of message, uh, management of field, and um, raising and, and spending of money. It's out of your control. Uh, if there were journalists in the audience, I would also talk about how creating the story was out of their control. So you, we've already talked about this uh, particular image. We all know it as the Hillary 1984 video. Um, this was the first political viral video of, of uh, the cycle. It's been seen now more than 5 million times on YouTube. I want to emphasize something about those YouTube numbers. And, and Pete mentioned them earlier. YouTube only counts a view if something is watched to the end. Um, and that means that, it doesn't mean that the person is still sitting there. You know, you can obviously walk away from your computer. But when you see a number like 5 million, that means it's 5 million full views. Okay? Um, and the cost to fill the valise of making this was a few hundred dollars. Um, and the cost of distributing it was nothing. This is another example of a viral video, the Yes We Can video that came out before Super Tuesday. More than 14 million views on YouTube. Just as a point of comparison, that, that came out in February. Um, for the month of February, the data suggests that the Barack Obama campaign website had only a total of 3 million visitors. So far more many views of this pro-Obama video than visits to his website in the month of February. Again, the campaign is no longer being created just by the campaign. It's being created by all these millions of new participants. Um, one lesson here for the consulting class is uh, they're not very good at making viral video. Uh, this is a still from the Hillary and the Band video that was made by the Clinton campaign, I think in January is when it came out. Um, go watch it. It's awful. Um, it sort of has her playing air guitar. And it's, it's, it's only had about 400,000 views. It was an official Hillary uh, Clinton campaign video. It was their attempt to reach young people. And the thing was really uh, inauthentic from the beginning. There have been far more effective pro-Hillary videos made by grassroots supporters for her than the campaign has made for itself. Um, now, Phil DeVelise, I think, said it best. This is the guy who made the, the, uh, uh, that YouTube video of uh, Hillary in 1984. This is after he was unmasked. You know, he, originally he was anonymous. He used the moniker Park Ridge 47, which for some of us signaled that he wanted a scavenger, fun to, a scavenger hunt to happen. Park Ridge is where Hillary was born in Illinois in 1947. Um, he said, the future of American politics rests in the hands of ordinary citizens. This ad was not the first citizen ad. It won't be the last. The game has changed. Now, let's talk a little bit about how it's changed in the field dimension. Uh, you've all heard about this by now, the numbers of people who are friending candidates. The candidates have gone where the people are hanging out, places like MySpace, Facebook, other big social network hubs. What you're looking at here is a chart. We, this is something we do over at Tech President. We, we started tracking these metrics going back to the beginning of 07. And the blue line there is Obama's uh, uh, rising numbers of, of um, friends on his MySpace page. The first thing you should notice about that is that, let's see if I can point. Ooh, look at that. Um, right there, that's the beginning of, of his campaign. He already had 40,000 friends on MySpace the day his campaign launched. How is that possible? The answer is, is that a volunteer going back two years earlier who had watched his speech, uh, actually three years earlier, had watched his speech at the Democratic Convention, was so inspired by it, 
created a MySpace page for Barack Obama. It was available, myspace.com slash Barack Obama. And it was a fan page. And this volunteer, Joe Anthony, toiled away at it every day, responding to emails from people who wanted to know how they could find out things about the campaign, where they could register to vote, to the point that by the time the Obama campaign started, they already had 40,000 friends on that site. And the campaign tried for a couple of months to work in collaboration with this volunteer. In other words, to let him keep running this very useful URL, myspace.com slash Barack Obama. Uh, if people were looking for Obama on MySpace, it was the likeliest place to find him. And then in April, they had a falling out. We reported on it quite closely. I could, we could get into more detail about what actually happened. But basically, the Obama campaign decided this was too valuable a place on the web to allow a volunteer to control. The guy is a paralegal living in, in Los Angeles. He's not in Chicago at campaign headquarters. They made him an offer. Uh, to, in essence, let us take over the site, just tell us what you think it's worth to you. He responded with a number, approximately $40,000. Then the campaign said, what are you, crazy? We can't pay you $40,000. They had a big split. We reported it. Um, and the, the result was a big black eye for the Obama campaign, by the way, because it showed some of us that they were not quite as friendly to their grassroots as it appeared because they wanted to control this very valuable place. They lost all of these friends. It went back down to zero because they had to start over. Um, when they took over that URL, it basically started with a blank slate. In the end, it didn't really kill them. They're actually up to about 350,000 there. Um, but it's a cautionary tale. I think they'd be much higher, by the way. Look where they were going um, if they hadn't had that, that whole uh, episode take place for them on MySpace. Um, here's another interesting metric to take a look at. This, the reason this is here, this is the Facebook friends for the candidates. Again, the blue is Obama. Um, and by the way, if you go to our site, one of the fun things there is you can uncheck any of these boxes. You can, you know, you can play with the data and see, you know, the trends more closely or spread out over the course of the year. Uh, we do the same thing for seeing how candidates are, how often they're mentioned on the blogs, um, uh, what their YouTube views are, uh, so go play with it. But what I find fascinating here is this, here's this takeoff point. That's January 2nd, 3rd, 4th. That's the Iowa caucus, okay? And then there's New Hampshire. And look at this rocket, okay? Obama goes from 200,000 friends on Facebook to over 800,000 today. The same effects that, that uh, Pete was showing you in terms of the fundraising numbers, we're also seeing it in grassroots affiliation with the candidates. Um, other examples of how the campaign is moving into the control of the grassroots. This is a site called Eventful, where people can not only list events, political events. This, this is their, uh, they're showing all the political events coming up around the country. Blue is Democratic, red is Republican. Um, they can also demand events. And the Edwards campaign latched onto this early and realized this could actually be a great driver for participation. Let's have a contest. And with whatever town around the country uh, votes has the highest number of demands for uh, John Edwards to come, they'll, uh, he'll go there and do an event. And um, it started out, you'd think the big cities would have the advantage, uh, but uh, an activist in Columbus, Kentucky, a young, a young man decided that rural America needed its place in the sun and started uh, networking in all the ways that he could think of. And ultimately, Columbus, Kentucky, was getting votes from other parts of the country, other small towns that were voting for it. Basically, they wanted to get a presidential candidate. And by the way, presidential candidates don't go to places like Columbus, Kentucky the year before the election. It doesn't make any sense. There's no money there. There's no media there. There are no early primary votes there. But something new is going on where people can demand, express demand, and candidates begin to respond. Ron Paul also did an event based off of this. I think some of the other candidates have as well. Um, fundraising. You all know about Act Blue. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it just to say, again, anybody can create their own PAC now. And the numbers are really starting to get impressive in terms of the, the fundraising that these networks are generating. What I did want to show you is what happened with the Ron Paul campaign, which in, in at least this one area has been the most innovative. 
unlike every other campaign this cycle, Ron Paul's uh, 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 was the most decentralized, um, out of control, if you will. And what this shows you is what happened after they started publishing real-time uh, uh, fundraising data on their site. Um, and there's a longer explanation for why they did that. But basically, they decided to put individual donor information as it came in. Name, city and state, amount. People started taking screenshots that would show, you know, look, I gave, right? And the, the, that kind of uh, virtuous cycle where people could, you know, sort of show their friends, I'm doing it, why don't you do it? This enabled people to create what became the Ron Paul money bombs. And these two charts, the first one, the, the smaller one, is, um, shows what happened on uh, November 5th, which was Guy Fawkes Day, the first one. They lined up about 40,000 people who all pledged to give $100 on the same day. They raised more than $5 million in one day. Uh, they did it again on, on the Boston Tea Party anniversary, December 16th, close to six, a little bit over $6 million in one day. Ron Paul raised more money in the fourth quarter of 2007 than any other Republican candidate for president, thanks to open source fundraising. Now, I'm going to just finish with two observations about uh, what lessons do we learn from this. The first one is that the network is more powerful than the list. Uh, this is a, uh, I like to ask people, what would you rather have? Uh, an email list with a million names on it and Bill Clinton who, uh, who is going to sign your emails and let his name appear in the subject line or a thousand bloggers blogging every day on your behalf? Which would you rather have? And I'm going to argue that the list is less valuable. Obviously, it's not an either or choice. You want to have both. And, but the Clinton campaign spent most of 2007 building one and not the other. And the result is lists are a one-way form of communication. Um, if the person signing the email's name in some way degrades in value and people are less inclined to open an email from Bill Clinton, the list is less valuable. A network, on the other hand, and this is just a map of the political blogosphere um, from uh, 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 a couple months ago. The, these are all Democratic-oriented blogs. Yellow is uh, media sites, red is the uh, Republican side of the blogosphere. Um, my last point uh, on the media effects is that the sound blast may be more powerful than the sound bite, or at least they're in competition with each other now. Um, Pete alluded to this. What we're seeing happen with the Obama campaign's use of uh, video on the web is they're providing a huge amount of content. They have more than a thousand videos that they've posted to YouTube over the course of the campaign, a couple more every day. And if you look at uh, the, the, t the top videos on that site, um, the average length, more than 13 minutes long, um, people are hungry for content. They are not getting it from television because television is by nature a scarce medium where time is limited, where we've seen the sound biting of politics, the amount of time a politician is quoted on network news has dropped from 43 seconds to 10 seconds. That's the, the incredible shrinking sound bite. Well, we're now living in the age of the growing sound blast. And the availability, the people are going to the web to get more information is what that says to me is not only uh, the first point that campaigns have to invest in building networks, not just lists. The other is that they have to produce and distribute a lot of rich content. And the 37-minute speech that uh, Obama gave on race, uh, which for a whole variety of reasons would be of interest to people, has now been viewed more than 5 million times. Again, 5 million views of a 37-minute piece of, of uh, video. Um, it's an enormously powerful new effect. I'm hopeful because I think it means that content may actually start to matter more than just sound bites in the political fight. Um, and I think this is just another example of how we are really beginning to live in a new age. Um, would love to continue the conversation both here and uh, online and at our conference. There's our contact information, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, talking to a lot of you here today. Thank you. So next up is going to be Tracy Russo, and I introduced her before, but just to remind you, she comes out of the Edwards campaign. You maybe can talk a little bit about yourself, but she's, uh, she's going to talk a little bit more of the practical side of what's going on. You don't have to stand up. It's all right. 
Okay, hi, thanks for coming. Um, so Peter's right, I did come from the Edwards campaign. Prior to joining the Edwards campaign, I had the fun privilege of working um, with Howard Dean at the DNC um, in their internet department. But before that, um, before I did internet full time, I did a little bit of everything on campaigns. I was a field organizer, I was a fundraiser. God bless you people who spend time in the call room. Um, I you know, did the press thing, I did a little bit of it all. And what I found was personally, I don't like to be bored. I don't like to do the same thing every day. And then if I did internet, I could stick my finger in everybody's pie um, and kind of make my job what I wanted it to be. Now, I disagree a little bit with Peter's original uh, PowerPoint presentation about a paradigm shift. I think that there is a transformation happening, but I don't particularly believe that the internet is going to radically change all of our politics. I think what the internet is doing is making our politics better. It's enhancing all of the things we normally do. It's making it easier to raise money. We still have to do it because no one will pay, pass public financing. Um, we still have to communicate with people. We still have to get them to the polls. But now, instead of having to sit on the phone and call one by one through a list of 100 possible volunteers, you can send an email to 1,000 and within an hour have your, you know, your office staffed. So I like to look at things um, from, I, I guess, a little bit more in the trenches perspective of saying how, how, is, how are the tools that are becoming available and the way that people are using them going to make it easier for us on the campaign or organization side to get to achieve our goals, to get our message out. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting to look at this presidential cycle because you have seen really different philosophies about how these tools can be used. You know, on one hand, you have the Clinton campaign, which has had a more top-down structure. Um, on the other hand, you have the Obama campaign, which has a seemingly grassroots, um, bottom-up kind of structure, but they've also chosen to kind of build their own space for people to come to. The Edwards campaign, I think we did a little bit of both. We wanted people to come to us. Uh, we had a kind of social network system that wasn't nearly as advanced as what the Obama campaign had to enable our volunteers to form groups, to meet up, to organize themselves. It was more geared towards kind of community service. Um, uh, but we also went to where people lived. We went to MySpace, to Facebook, we went to blogs, we engaged with bloggers, and we talked to them because, you know, every day people are going on the internet to do whatever it is they're doing. They're emailing their friends, they're checking out eBay, um, you know, if you're shopping, I'm sure I do a lot of shopping. <laughs> Um, my dad uh, is a collector of classic cars, and he spends a lot of time on uh, car forums, uh, which surprisingly have political conversations happening within their message boards. I know because they don't like John Edwards, um, and I would often get Google alerts from CorvetteForums.com, and I was like, gosh, that's probably my dad. So. <laughs> Uh, th so there it is. But th the point is that people are living their lives online and they're doing it in a way that means that if we want to communicate with them, if we want to communicate with the American electorate, we have to go where they are. That's why we went to TV, because people were plopped down in front of their TV and we could interrupt their lives and we could talk to them by putting an ad on television. Now you could choose to skip over all your ads because you have TiVo or a DVR or you watch all your TV online like I do. Um, so you don't necessarily know that you're going to reach people that way. It doesn't mean that we can't reach people that way at all, but it means the way that we're doing it is changing. And so a campaign or organization that's going to be successful in this kind of new era is going to have to integrate all of these new tools into all of the things they're already doing. And that's a little bit scary for some people because they don't quite understand what it is. So for them, you know, internet has always been the department in the corner with some strange kind of young kid who can fix your computer when it breaks. Uh, that's not what it is anymore. Essentially, it's a communications department um, that is leveraging an entirely new media and, you know, has a little bit of ADD and likes to be part of everything that's happening. So, you know, I think the biggest challenge that we're seeing is how does a campaign or organization that has more limited resources than, than what we're seeing at the presidential level where they have millions and millions of dollars and 20 or 30 staffers working in their departments 
Edwards, FYI, only like five to seven staffers. <laughs> But I mean, the point is at a congressional level or you know, a state senate level, you have maybe two staffers total, a fundraiser and a campaign manager. And your campaign manager doubles as your communications director and your press secretary and your advance guy. And you know, there's all these balls that they're constantly juggling up in the air. And so how can these tools make it easier for them to do all the jobs that they're already doing? So that's where I think that the uh, tools and technology that we're talking about today can be of help. And there's, um, you know, there's different ways that all of this can be integrated into what you're doing. You know, Mika just talked about the power of the list versus the power of the network. You know, list these days is the holy grail of politics. You know, how big is your list? How many people can I email right now? Um, and building a network is a lot harder. There's these bloggers out there, and maybe they're wearing pajamas in their basement. FYI, they're not. Um, <laughs> but maybe that's what you think. You know, people um, don't realize that you know the the power of a front page post on Daily Coast may meet, reach more people than the front page of you know your local newspaper these days, and it goes farther and spreads faster than something that's coming to your door. Um, so I think that there are a lot of considerations that campaigns and, and organizations um, are, are looking at when they're saying, how do I move into this space? Um, and so what I like to do is say, you know, come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> uh, we're not going to um, you know, put you through an HTML test or something like that before we let you go on the internet. Um, I think the best thing to do is to see, you know, what is it that you're already doing and are, your, are the people you're trying to reach, are they doing it online? If you're an environmental organization, there are massive number of websites devoted to living green. There are bloggers who blog specifically about climate policy. There's bloggers who blog specifically about, I don't know, like, you know, pink hair ribbons. I mean, people, the, it, it, there's something for everyone out there. The key is to having that conversation and being willing to engage in it. Um, being willing to say, you know, there's people who care about this campaign that are outside of the room that we're in right now. Um, and what are they saying? Are you paying attention to the things that people are saying about your organization or your candidate online? Do you know what's being said or where it's being said? And are you participating in that discussion? You know, a lot, a lot, can be uh, accomplished by just a simple email to someone who may be talking about you, who maybe doesn't have the right information that you can provide them with. And at the Edwards campaign, one of the things that I was very proud of is that we didn't necessarily want to control every aspect of every discussion. What we wanted was to be able to provide our supporters with the tools and resources that they needed to spread the message themselves. So that meant, number one, knowing who those supporters were finding them online, building a group of our kind of super activists who could act in a kind of rapid response capacity. And then once we knew who they were, finding out what it is they needed. Did they need a video from us? Did they need a speech or an answer to a policy question? What is it that they were trying to do in their own kind of way to support John Edwards and how could we enable them to do it better? Um, and so a lot of what our department did was work to provide those resources. So maybe it wasn't as overt or, you know, as obvious because it wasn't as if we were saying, you know, giving it to a huge public list, but we would give it to one, two, three people, whoever would ask, and they would be able to take it and run with it. They would be able to form, you know, there wasn't just, there was a MySpace page for John Edwards, but there was also a MySpace page for John Edwards' um, gay and lesbian supporters that was run by this awesome kid named Arthur who, uh, you know, made his own logo, put his, you know, we gave him the policy information that he requested. He was able to form that into kind of like flyers and opinion pieces and make, you know, stickers and buttons and, and things that he could use to support Senator Edwards in his own way. And we just gave him the power to kind of run with that and do what it is what he wanted to do. We never said, hey, you should start this page. The page was there. We just said, we're really glad that you did this. How can we help you make it better? So, you know, I can talk forever about this, so I'm really actually looking forward to the question period. But if, if I could leave you with anything, the thing that I want to leave you with is that, you know, all of the things that we're talking about seem incredibly new or incredibly different and exciting, and oh, you can raise $10 million in a day. 
but you know, that's at a very, one very high level. When you get down to it in the day to day of what most of us are dealing with, with our candidates or organizations or you know, whomever it is that you represent, you're dealing with a smaller scale and you need to know where the conversation is happening and you need to be part of that conversation. Thank you. Now we're going to have Jerry Mikowski, and again, to remind you, he's coming from the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, and uh, giving them more of a tech perspective. Jerry? Thanks, Pete. I'm going to follow time-honored precedent and stand as well. Um, so I'm not actually a geek. I've never programmed for a living. I'm kind of an observer of the, of the tech scene, have been for a while. Uh, I didn't realize we'd drop the HTML test to be able to be on the net. That was kind of cool. Um, and what I'd like to do is build a little context. Uh, Pete asked me to look ahead, to look forward a little bit, which I love to do. So I'm going to be a little ambitious and try to state um, some broader context of where I think we might be. Um, and let me start by saying that I think what's happening right now, what we're in the middle of, is that we're weaving a global brain. We're changing the fabric of community and communications. We're, we're using these new tools in a way that I think will profoundly change the way we see each other, perceive each other, the way organizations perceive us, the way organizations interact, all these different sorts of things are actually going to change quite deeply. And I think we're sort of 20 or 30 years into what may be a 50 or 60 year process. So it's ugly right now, it's very chaotic and all the tools are still in tinker toy parts on the floor and people are assembling them in, in really nifty ways. But, but every time that somebody friends me on Facebook or every time that somebody blogs about someone else's blog post or about mainstream media or every time Dave Witzel posts on Twitter that something is happening in this room, which he's doing right now live. He's building a little neural connection, okay? A, a friending is like a little neural pathway between two people, and it looks really trivial. So if you look on Facebook and you look at this mini feed thing, it's exhausted. It looks really trivial. It looks like nonsense. But what all those things are is little filaments of connectivity between all of us that later on become the highways of actual communication and actual trust building over time. So I learn about Dave that he's good at live blogging, and so I start following him. <clears throat> so then later, when something really important happens, I might wait what he says more than what somebody else says. This is a little bit how a brain works locally inside one skull, except what's beginning to happen is we're connecting up brains between skulls. It's an inter-skull brain, somehow. I just made that up. Um, but I'm not trademarking it. I'm open sourcing it right now. So, I mean, I, yeah, exactly. Creative Commons, I realize it's also not very good. Um, so I think we're in the, in the middle of creating a global brain. and, and one of the things that lets us do this is this brand new uh, phenomenon I refer to as persistence. And it, you could probably pick an easier word for it. But the notion here is that I can create something and I can leave it out in cyberspace and it persists. It stays there. I can walk away and go about my day. You know, Micha can write posts and do all kinds of interesting things. And then he goes and, and travels here and talks. And everything he's put up in cyberspace still stays there. And it's really hard for anyone else to shut it down. Really hard. So, this got big around the year 2000, roughly, second millennium. And let me just point out that through all of recorded history and back into prehistory, this was impossible for humans to do. You could argue that, yes, you could publish a book, but to publish a book, you had to find an agent, you had to find a publisher, you had to make it through the filter who had good judgment about what books should or shouldn't be published, et cetera, et cetera. So you can play that out. I'm sure you've heard those, those kinds of things before. But, but now the tool for connecting up to anybody is in practically anybody's hands. The cell phone more and more is becoming the tool of choice, in particular as you go down toward the so-called bottom of the pyramid, uh, where people don't have access to laptops and full keyboards. They may not be literate, but they're getting connected. And these little filaments of connection are the avenues for future um, communication. One of the things that's happening there is that all these barriers are being breached and we are actually renegotiating the social contract. So you can read Rousseau, you can read Hobbes, you can read Locke, you can read whoever you want and they all have ideas about why we have a Marx and, and so forth. We all, they all have ideas about why we have a social contract and what that social contract might be. Um, usually the social contract is about avoiding chaos, avoiding the mob. By the way, the word democracy until the middle of the 19th century was a pejorative term. It was a bad word. It usually meant the tyranny of the majority, right? So what we're doing now is figuring out how else might this social contract work, and in very tiny ways, out of the political view mostly, in, in sort of at the grassroots, really getting things done, people are starting to figure out, do I trust you or do I not? 
And how do you and I figure out how to take over our neighborhood and get that crack house taken over and bought and painted and dressed up really nicely so we can stop this crime wave that's moving toward us because we actually pulled data that, was in the, what we, that we forced into the public domain. We looked at a map and we noticed that the crime was moving toward us. So how do we figure out how to do that? How do we collectively build GPS-based maps of terrain in the United Kingdom, go look at openstreetmaps.org, um, at collectively replacing and in fact improving on a database that the British government doesn't want to release. And now that we've done that together, that one little focused project, now we trust each other and maybe that network is good for other sorts of things. Who knows? Who knows what? But now they know each other. So all these things are these filaments, these dendrites, these little synaptic connections between human beings and then also between clusters of human beings because we tend to sort of, we, we like packs. We like associating in groups. We have, you know, there's, there's the Dunbar number. There's a whole bunch of numbers that say that we, we sort of cluster up. But this is good in many ways. So I'm pretty optimistic about where we're going. Another one of the things that's happening as we pierce the barriers that used to keep society in place in a lot of ways is that we're rebalancing the left and the right brain. So I'm going to continue a little bit on this global brain metaphor. And I will submit to you that we've been subject to about a 5,000 plus year left brain overdose. It's sort of a male testosterone overdose too. Um, and that the systems and institutions that we live in today and take for granted today are all designed sort of by engineers who don't have much knowledge of social dynamics and of what makes people actually connect to each other and what makes people have emotion and connect and trust and all those sorts of things. So our educational system, our political system, consumer mass marketing, all these sorts of things that we go, oh my God, oh my God, they're changing. Well, yeah, they were all kind of designed to prevent the worst of us from becoming the mob and then also to know how to command and control, to know how to structure these things. Our compulsory education system is an excellent um, example of this. So in, in, in fact, now we're starting to rebalance this. So you saw Micha point out sort of it used to be top down, now it's many to many. All these sorts of things are signs of the great rebalancing. We are, in fact, right now in the middle of what I would call a Cambrian explosion of creativity. There's just this enormous amount of experimentation. The cost of experimenting in this funny little geek medium has fallen to nothing. It used to be you wanted to start a tech company and write some software. You had to buy servers and rent some space and pay people and have lots of salaried employees and start a company and get some venture funding. And, and if you got venture funding, that meant you had to pay them back 20 times over in five years. And all that, all that stuff is gone. On your credit card and a couple other people's credit cards, you can set a really viable service. It will only get future funding if the curve of usability actually starts moving up before you ask for the funding. It's very, very interesting. The cost of playing in this and experimenting has fallen to nothing. So we're getting all these creative little mix-ups. If you're interested in Twitter, which is this funny little instant messaging thing, go look at twitterholic.com and then go read all the different things that people are riffing on Twitter because the data is just publicly available. There's one thing after another. You can t do Twitter vision and see where people are tweeting around the world as they tweet all these funny little things. So um, we're in this Cambrian explosion of creativity and part of what's happening looks really foolish and looks like exhaust data. Part of it is really substantive, but is mostly out of the public view because it's kind of boring. It's, it's people actually meeting and making decisions and figuring out how to trust each other. It doesn't make the news because there's no blood, there's no violence. So I think there's probably 20 to 30 years to go, and then we might reach another point of stability, sort of, I, I believe in this punctuated equilibrium theory of history where things are stable for a while and then something happens and then we wind up in a different direction. And when something happens, there's a big sort of loop and you get a reaction, then you get an, an ab reaction, you get backlash, then you get more, and then, then things settle into some new vector. Things are different before and after that equilibrium, that, that shift in equilibrium point. One of the things that happens at major changes is that you get gaps. So one of the nifty things to do right now, and I think part of what Pete was explaining, is that there are, there are technology gaps where one group understands something sooner and better than somebody else does. So they leap on it and they take advantage of it and it wins them advantage in the near term. And this is happening now in the political realm and as, as we talk about all the different ways that this is happening, I think you can see that gaps are being exploited and people are figuring out, oh my God, I need to do this in a new way and suddenly for no money I can get you know, $5 million in a day, oh, $10 million in a day, or whatever else. Um, I'm really hopeful that the $3 billion campaign, I, I don't understand what we're doing pumping $3 billion into TV. I, that, that just blows my mind that that could even happen, that we're going to fuel the TV industry in order to elect somebody. Um, so I'm really hopeful that all these inexpensive ways of communicating and linking and joining and linking arms and figuring things out socially will actually take over and that you know, the, the TV budget for the campaign in 2050 is you know, $18.96. <laughs> 
There are also these funny hiccups that happen along the way. So in 1981, I remember uh, exchanging files and playing an online game with a reporter, except we had communicated one-to-one -one over, you know, over dial-up using Kermit and other funny little technical protocols. And I thought, soon everybody will be doing this. And then in 1991, I watched as the fax just went whipping on by. And in 1991, if your organization didn't have a fax, your organization didn't exist. You couldn't close a deal because nobody could fax you a contract, et cetera, et cetera, right? I'm like, fax, really stupid. You get a piece of paper at the other end. You then have to retype. And in 2001, the internet shows up, and now we're exchanging documents. And we sort of get back to what I thought was happening in 81, but there was this really big detour. So there's not only detours, but sometimes there's huge unintended consequences. And something that's done for one reason shows up in a different way that, that's not just different. It's vile and horrifying. So, so Galileo was under military contract to take these lens thingies and make a telescope so that we could look at the military people on the other side of that hill and get more intelligence. Then he turned the thing upward and started telling us that the skies were different than we thought they were. And the people who believed what was happening in the field over there when they looked through the telescope that away thought he was lying when he pointed the telescope up and showed, him and showed them stars and galaxies. They couldn't conceive that what he was showing them was actually true. Okay? So, so these things are mental blockbusters, and it's okay. Just listen. If you feel your, your gut just rise or your throat just constrict when you hear something that sounds like way outlandish, sit with that for a little while, because it could be that that's the stars, right? So part of what's happening now is that we're rethinking also things that we throw around here as if they were normal and everyday things and will stay the same forever. One of them is journalism and one of them is government. And I tend to refer to small g governance these days instead of big g government. And I'm a big fan of governance, in particular self-governance, and I don't mean just me for me, but I mean people collecting together and figuring out how do we govern ourselves now that we can communicate. And I'll point you here to Clay Shirky's new book, Here Comes Everybody. It's a beautifully written book, very, very accessible, quick run through the kinds of forces that are at hand right now that are allowing us to connect up in ways that a decade ago, a mere decade ago, we couldn't do. So one of the things he does early in the book is he compares airline strandings, basically passengers stuck on the tarmac for eight or nine hours. And 14 years ago, there was an incident that Northwest Airlines basically waited out. Four year, years ago, there was an incident that was roughly the same duration on an airplane, except one of the passengers got off, got really mad, and then went on the net and started finding who were the other passengers. Before you know it, she had 30,000 people signed up and Congress passed a passenger's bill of rights. And Clay is suggesting that the difference between the two incidents, really the major difference, is that today we're beginning to have these tools to get together and do stuff, which I think is awesome. And I'm, I'm generally optimistic about this. I tend to be pessimistic in the short run because I know about all these little highways, byways, gaps that take taken advantage of, the politics and so forth that happens in between. And to me, politics is a, is a derogatory term. So I know that we're here in the middle talking about politics as if it's a good thing and as if all this money going into TV is a good thing. To me, this is the exception to the rule and we're hopefully going to get past this. And we'll figure out not, by the way, direct democracy. Nobody really knows what it is. Everybody's scared shitless of it. Democrats are scared to death of it. Republicans are scared to death of it. Nobody really knows what direct democracy is. It's a frightful kind of term. So we're going to figure something out and I'm not quite sure what it is, but it has all these all these bits of evidence um, around all of this. Um, so journalism is changing deeply and dramatically. We talk about how the, the blogosphere affects you know, the mainstream media and so, on, and so on and backwards and forwards. And mainstream media is defeating itself. It's basically had so many incidents now of, of um, lack of credibility and, and, and sort of destroying itself. I think what begins to happen is that journalism is going to start to split. We're going to get investigative journalism the Cy Hirsch's, the, the uh, Lowell Bergman's, and other sorts of people. And they need to be funded. We need to figure out how to take investigative reporters and editors and give them lots of money and make sure they live forever. The mainstream media kind of flutters and flounders and sort of kills itself through destroying its own credibility and being owned by people like Berlusconi. And then the grassroots, the net roots, the whatever else, slowly figures out whom to trust, how to trust them by building these little dendritic connections and building this global brain and pointing to mainstream media stuff when it's good and when it's, when it's authentic and when it's real and then outing it when it's not. And, and nobody can necessarily be trusted just because they're there. You learn to trust people over time. We forget about the role of time because we're accustomed to a, the old style model where you launch a new product by buying a lot of media and saying, trust me, trust me. And th that's not what's happening right now. You trust people because they did something good for quite a long period of time. 
So that's all I wanted to put on the table, and let's get to some questions. Thank you. Let's put it open to questions. We are, this is getting videoed by Politics TV, which is our partner and always does these things. It's going to be on the web, so wait for the, um, the microphone to, so we can get it on the, on the video. There's a guy right back here. It's Dave. Oh, it's Dave. Okay. I can't see. Excellent. Um, I, I want to just follow up on the journalism comment. You said there were two, you, you thought it was going to split into two pieces, uh, investigative journalism, which needs to be funded. Excellent. And what was the other part? It was grassroots journalism? Yeah, the, and I, I think two is probably the wrong number. It probably splinters into lots of things. But the two that I'm watching are investigative journalism. And then the bottom is the net roots and, and the blogosphere interacting with what remains of, of mainstream media over time. And I don't think mainstream media goes away by any means. Uh, but I think that, it, that it winds up being symbiotically related to everything else that we do and pay attention to, which then, in effect, becomes one large watchdog sitting over it. Uh, Mika may have a... Yeah, well, there, you yeah. know, I'm thinking of... of uh, uh, there was a story in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, this is on, I, who, uh, talking about how young people get news now. They don't have the daily news habit, you know, that, that we grew up with, which is you check the news at least once a day, you buy a newspaper or you watch TV. They don't have it. And the most interesting comment was from uh, a college student who said, if, th if there's something important in the news, it will find me. My friends will tell me about it. And that, t that was really interesting to me because it, it suggested a f that, that this person felt like if it, was, if it really is important, my network will bring it to my attention. And I trust my network more than all these other sources of information that are propped up by money or corporate control or whatever those things may be. And so I think journalism in that way is changing. I, I'd add one other element to this, which just building on what Jerry said, which is the data is out there. And not only is it persistent, but the tools for sifting it and, and discovering and spreading important data are, have become immensely powerful. Um, and uh, if anything, I, what does this mean for politics? I think it means that, you know, uh, for example, the people, since we're next to Capitol Hill, I'll use this example, the people who are complaining about their uh, personal financial disclosure statements uh, being on the web are uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, the, the barn door is open, folks. I mean, you can't stop this. Uh, if it was required to be published, made public, it's going to get on the web. And, um, you know, if, if, if uh, you put information there that you didn't want people to know, then the problem is with the, you know, the information that was re required to be put out. Um, if it's interesting, people will spread it, and it'll come to public light. Okay. Um, right there. Go ahead. Oop, oop. C could you... Uh, the mic. Just a quick question for Jerry. What was the name of the book that you talked about? Yeah, about? Here Comes Everybody. Uh, the, the author? The author is Clay Shirky, S-H-I-R-K-Y. Just published like a month ago. The, 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 I would just add to that, as, uh, also I'd, I'd recommend the book. It, it's a really good also explanation of what, what you really mean by social media and social networking in the broadest sense. It's essentially, uh, it's a very, very clear and accessible way to understand um, a much deeper shift going into social media, basically, as opposed to traditional media. Mm -hmm. This one up here. If you could just maybe mention your name and, and if you want to, your organization, if you're part of something. Or Sam Bleacher, no affiliation. Mika, you made a comment about investing, about campaigns investing in, in the networks as opposed to investing in lists. Now, what do you mean by investing? What exactly are campaigns doing? Sure. I, mean, I understand that there's a lot of networking that's, that people do spontaneously. Right. And, and, uh, and you were talking about that, about the Edwards campaign. You're checking in on them. Uh, but how did the Obama campaign invest in you? Well, that's, the, let, me, let me ask another part of it. Um, because so I think it's another good question we need to look at. Obama's campaign has been fanta fantastically successful at all this, and we talk about it, and, and we hear about it every 30 seconds up here. What about campaigns that tried to do the same thing and did not succeed? Was it because they didn't do it right, or because they don't have the content, or what's, what's the difference? Well, I, w I would actually argue, uh, I mean, if we just use the presidential cycle as, as a, a test bed, 
okay, which it inevitably is. There are advantages there that don't apply to lower level races. There's all this free attention. People actually get themselves off their couches and care about who's going to be the next president in a way that's very different than who their next congressman is going to be. Though the scale, you know, if you're operating in a congressional district and you can create, you know, and, and your member puts themselves up on Facebook and they have 500 friends who are local in that district, that's pretty significant. 500 people network together in a congressional district is a very powerful force. Um, so two things. Uh, the Obama campaign obviously uh, built on things that were done in the Dean campaign. They actually, you can trace the, the, the DNA of Obama, my Barack Obama, his social network uh, platform, straight back to the Dean campaign. It was a, a, a site called Dean Space, which then the people who built that uh, uh, created a, a firm called Blue State Digital. Blue State Digital built the same platform for a, a group out in Colorado called Progress Now. Uh, Progress Now, by the way, has 300,000 active members in the state on its social network hub, uh, which is uh, one out of 10 registered voters. Um, Progress Now, uh, Blue State Digital sold the same platform to the DNC. It's called Party Builder. And if you look at Party Builder and you look at my Barack Obama, they're basically the same tool set. Um, and uh, this, it, this, by the way, is not an expensive platform. If you go to Blue State Digital and say, how much does it cost? They'll say twenty or $30,000, maybe a little bit more to customize it. So it makes sense, by the way, for the party uh, organs to be buying these tools and, and then giving them uh, to state local folks, um, not that you have to go get your own. Um, uh, Tracy would, I'm sure, point out that it isn't just that you have a platform, but that you work it, right? And that means uh, going to where people already are. Um, the Obama campaign had a, a group on Facebook called Million Strong for Barack, which was a self-organized group started by a college student uh, that took off like a rocket. But then the Obama campaign went to them and said, we've got to move these people off of Facebook and onto our platform. There are limitations with Facebook's group tools. That was the biggest reason. And they also wanted to you know, put their arms around their network. Um, so, but just to give you two examples of campaigns, I mean, I think the Edwards campaign uh, lasted longer in this cycle, in part because of their investment in, in network building and, and um, I would say the Huckabee campaign on the Republican side, as well as the poll campaign. Huckabee made fantastic use of, of support from grassroots bloggers. There were two kids, 18, 19 year old kids, um, who created something called Huck's Army on his behalf that had 20,000 members. Um, and I would argue that his longevity in the race was also a function of his uh, campaign's willingness to experiment and, and you know, in some ways, uh, build and ride the support that you can get from a network um, that kept him in longer than, say, you know, Giuliani, who, you know, ran the classic front runner, big money, you know, uh, uh, all, what is it, all, all hat, no cattle. I mean, there was nothing there underneath it. Um, and we're watching McCain right now, and, and to, you know, add to Peter's point, um, there is almost no organic social media being created on behalf of John McCain. Um, if you look at uh, the, the affiliation that we're seeing go to the candidates through big social networking sites like Facebook or MySpace, he is at one-tenth the level of what the Democratic field has. Um, they go into the fall with a huge disadvantage, and I think they won't be able to catch up. But some polls would have him running relatively close to either, can, either Democratic candidate. At What's the moment, the polls are measures of, of name recognition. Uh, I think what the web is is an early indicator of intensity of support. Um, the reason why we're still spending money on television is that you still have to reach low information voters. There's still a lot of them, people who don't have the time or inclination to pay close attention. But I would argue that the reason to invest uh, a lot on this sort of online, offline, uh, we like to use the word offline uh, activity, is there may be uh, somewhere between 10 to 20 million political activists in the United States, people who are intensely involved. They're the kind of people who write letters to the editor, who donate money to campaigns, who organize events, go to rallies, whatever 
Um, they happen to be very influential on their peers, and they correlate very closely with the people who are not just going online to get information, but going online to create and share information. The Pew Internet studies suggest uh, somewhere around 15 million people in 2006 not only went online to get political information, but created or shared. Those are your, they, these people track very closely to the influencers, the activists. So, uh, you know, if the idea here is how do you organize uh, for power, how do you organize to win campaigns, you actually build on the people who are already most active. And I think the easiest way to find them is, is uh, through all the stuff we're talking about. Can I just yeah, one of you, you should add to that. I think. Um, you know, I think that, that one thing that, that kind of gets lost in the mix when you're talking about the success of the Obama campaign is that, you know, he, it, it's not just about about what the campaign is doing. I mean, above all of this, you can't argue that they have an incredible product to work with. <laughs> they have a compelling, attractive, young candidate that is able to, to very easily relate to the demographic that's online, which is, you know, on one hand, you know, very young, the Facebook kind of MySpace, YouTube generation, but on the other hand, that kind of like high information progressive, you know, well-educated, wealthier person, which is what, what surveys tell us is the demographic of, of a blog readership, you know, uh, tends to have graduated college, make over $80,000 a year, possibly higher education, you know, in the 45 to 55 range is, is the highest, you know, number of, of blog readers. Um, so, so I think that they, they have like a little bit of a built-in demographic advantage that, that people tend to you know, overlook is they're attributing all the fabulousness of all, you know, all the online tools. And I think it, it's, you need to take that kind of with a grain of salt and, and look at not only, you know, what's there, but also the work that they've put into it. What they've done that, that is brilliant and an incredible um, uh, foresight, foresight when you see ahead, mm -hmm. see ahead <laughs> on their part is, is that they invested in building these, building their own social network. They invested in building their email list. The money that they've put online in advertisements, I don't, I don't know if it's just me, if I'm just hyper-targeted by them, but everywhere I go on the internet, I see an ad for Barack Obama. Every website, all over the place. Um, and you know, they sent emails early on that weren't just give me money, give me money, give me money, but asked, asked their supporters to do things that made them feel like they were part of the process. Write a letter to our volunteers in Iowa so they know that you people in Florida are pulling for them to win. This kind of feel good community building was incredibly important in these early stages of the campaign, especially you know, when you look back and when we see how, how you know, Hillary Clinton was just gonna get it. It was it, it was done. Why are the rest of us even running? Because obviously she's going to win. But they didn't care about that and they knew that their supporters didn't believe that and they leveraged that power. You know, the Clinton campaign has been incredibly successful online when you look at the way that they've used the internet blogs um, and kind of their online resources to manipulate the media in their favor. Um, it may not seem so evident today <laughs> or this week, um, but you know, when, when we had eight candidates in a debate, Hillary's campaign was controlling what the pundits were saying before the debate was even over. Um, their, their, their use of their fact check hub, which put basically all of their research online and made it publicly accessible. So it wasn't just, you know, their, you know, Phil Singer sending off an oppo document to the Politico or, you know, the Washington Post. It was out there for everybody to see. It became, even though if it was their document, they put it together, somehow by putting it online and having a URL that you can link to, all of a sudden it's credible and, and it's, it's a source. Um, and so I think that both campaigns have had tremendous successes in, in using the online space. They've just done it in very different ways. I think we got changed for, for time for one, one uh, comment here. There's a woman here in the front. <coughs> I'm sorry, well, there are going to be other, many other opportunities to interact here, but uh, before lunch. No, here, there's a woman up here in the front I was thinking. Sorry. Thank you. Janet Olazak. I am a former candidate, and I had the experience, I live in Fairfax, of using the van, which is now going to be, or maybe we're the last in Virginia, to utilize a national program. The van, as opposed to the Republican voter vault, has a voter file that 
candidates always need access to. How does the information that you're providing today, for those of us who haven't really embraced it as fully as we need to, how does that interact for democratic campaigns in a way that networking can become the informational, um, to fill the information gap that the van clearly has? Well, I I, I think yeah. I've used the van, and um, thank you for running. I think actually one of my friends may have worked for you, because um, I got Facebook messages about you. Um, but you know, the pro part of the problem is that you know the party, the Democratic Party, is still catching up on the data. It's one thing that I think that the Republicans had when it comes to the voter data ahead of us. Um, and, and the problem is that we have these great databases for, for, voter, for voters now that are kind of clean and we know that they work. And, but then we have an entirely separate database for fundraising and an entirely separate database that's managing our email list. The, what we need to get to is a database that lets all of those databases talk to each other. You know, at a, at a higher level, at the presidential level, you can take your voter data, database and you can match it to your email address. You can pay for the data and the work that it takes to make those things work together, but at the smaller level for congressional races, it's kind of a, a hurdle that we just haven't, I think, got to yet as a party. Could, could I? Oh, oh, I was just going to say yeah. one thing. Could you get the, the Vijay? Could you? Do you want to comment on this? We're, we're actually going to have a whole breakout session on on basically database and uh, micro targeting, and I think it's just worth. Uh, Vijay is one of our speakers later, and he's literally with Catalyst in this in this exact space. Could you just give him the, the phone and then we can also get a comment here. He'll be right after lunch. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Vijay Ravindran and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Catalyst. And I uh, have a plug my 2.30 talk, which actually goes into a lot of detail as to how the voter file is being taken to another level from where it was in 2004. And in particular, it really touches on what you're talking about, which is building the bus that can be used to integrate across all the different silos that are out there. And so I don't know whether, Pete, do you want to spend more time than that well, here? Or? Well, that's good. I, just, I did want to yeah. just say we've got a really key person to talk about. If you want to make a comment, that's fine, too. Or just uh, do, you, do anything that's specifically to the question, basically? Well, I think the, the, big, the big thing where we've lagged behind is on data collection. And so um, you know these campaigns, and uh, we've worked with, with both of the major presidentials, not as much with the Edwards campaign last year. And I think it's still, we're scratching the surface in bringing all the different data together and then being able to then bring it back out to the masses in a way that can be used properly. And so that's the big gap that exists. And the, the Republicans, because they're uh, so uh, homogenous in how they actually use the tools that they do have, even if they're less powerful and less diverse, um, have uh, really gotten disciplined about capturing that information for many years, and so that's one of the gaps that we're trying to close. But I think um, the van is actually, what, what, the, what the DNC has done with distributing the vans out is a great first step, because not only is it giving data out, but it's also creating a standardized way for data to come back in that can be then repurposed back out. And I think the next step is what Tracy's referring to, so. Okay, last comment did you wanna yeah, make really, on this question? Go really ahead. Really briefly on the same question. Um, I understand the need and the frustration to try to integrate the databases and get sort of more unification. That makes sense to me. I wanted to talk about the bottom-up part of it, where there's, in some sense, really light integration that works really beautifully. So I've installed a little Facebook application called Twitter Sync. Whenever I put something on Twitter, it ca automatically cascades over and becomes my Facebook status also. And that, so each of my networks starts to sort of trickle together in different ways. This has turned into five or six stories I could tell of really interesting incidents that information came back to me because it had this rippling effect across networks. Second comment is, I follow Obama on Twitter and, and a couple other things. If, if any one of these candidates actually called out one of the people who's trying to talk to them and addressed them specifically, I think that would have a, a transformative magical effect here because so far they're just using it as Obama is about to go give a campaign speech in North Carolina. It's just the, the same old message stream coming out. They're not connecting to anybody, and they don't need to connect to everybody, but connecting once or twice or three times turns it into sort of a little lottery. It's a little bit like, pardon the, uh, the home shopping network, pardon the, the, the analogy here, but on home shopping network, you know, you could be on TV, and that could be your 15 minutes of fame, and nobody will be friendlier to you than the host on home shopping, <laughs> trust me, right? And then the third little comment here is that 
all these top-down ways of aggregating a big list and sending out action notices and trying to figure out what will move whom. In particular, you know, uh, uh, bourbon drinkers tend to vote this way and like this issue, right? This is all about inference, and you have to collect a lot of data, and your data better be clean, and you're working really hard, and that will get better and better. But the other side of it is just about action and passion and connecting into what people are trying to get done together. And nobody's really figured out how to do that really well yet. And there's this enormous wide open field right there at almost no cost. It's all about doing the right things. Thank you. Thanks for the panel here. And what we're going to do is break for grab lunch and grab, go through the buffet and then come back here because we're going to have Joe Trippi up for the lunch thing. But thank you for the, thank you for the speakers here. Thanks very much.